God said for us in these end times, and for everybody that really believes, eyes off the world system. Why? Because it, everywhere it's broken and failing. So if you're putting your eyes on it too much, it's going to discourage you. Okay? Common sense. So if you want the world to be fixed, not in your lifetime, honey. Okay? In God's lifetime. Okay? What do you mean by that? We're going to be up here. We're going to be fixed. You might not be around when God finishes his dealings. Can you say amen? But the Bible says that when Jesus comes to get his second time, not the rapture, but his second time, we're going to ride with him. Okay? Also, God told us to get our eyes off of people. Folks, if you put your eyes on me, and if you focus hard enough, you're going to see my faults. Hello? Look at your neighbor and say, yeah. <laughs> You focus on people long enough, you're going to see their faults because Satan will see to it. And then you'll justify you not doing things by the faults of others, which is a simple baby game that Satan plays with humanity. Folks, do you want to be a part of a game piece that Satan plays with you? Of course not. But let's follow God and learn to walk with him. So our eyes are off of people because people are human. People make mistakes. People sometimes think they're doing good. Here's a thought. Why do we have an unsaved person ruling over this nation? So get to praying, church. Okay. Then the third thing that God said, and this is the trickiest one, eyes off ourself. You see, you'll never hurt my feelings if my eyes aren't on myself. So, listen, if you're a young Christian, now listen, I'm talking to you because we have all kinds, and you get your feelings hurt a lot, that means there's a lot of growth going and caution because sometimes we wear them on our shirt sleeve. Look at your neighbor and say, not me, thank God. <laughs> Some people come to church with a chip already on their shoulders. Yeah. They're waiting for somebody to knock it off so they can justify backsliding right. or being away from God. Now, we know all these games. These are games Satan plays with the church. So we're not coming against the church. Now, let me give you a scripture in 2 Corinthians. This is before I even preach. In chapter 5, where it says that we're new creations in Christ Jesus. If you read a little bit before that, you'll find out it says, Though we know men after the flesh, and though we have known the Lord after the flesh, know we him like that no more. What it's saying to us is we don't see the physical flesh of others. We see the Jesus in them or the potential of Jesus in them. Say amen. amen. That doesn't mean we go reach down and get bit by the dog. But we have a, should have an ability by the Holy Spirit to read people and to help people and to not focus on their faults. Because this side of heaven, we all have them. How about we just have a little contest? Who's got the most faults in the room? <laughs> <laughs> so listen to me. Focus not on what? World system is failing. What has Satan got everybody to do the last four years? Tag, you're it. When are we going to grow? Get beyond the religious part. It doesn't fit your doctrine. How about Jesus never fits our doctrine? They crucified him because they didn't fit his, their doctrine. So let's go on. Second of all, eyes off of people. I would like to encourage you, though, even though I'm a marvelous preacher and a good teacher of the word, please don't put your eyes on me as some marvelous example. I'm just joking with you. How many know you don't set your eyes as examples on people? And we do that because everybody has a favorite baseball team or a favorite football team, maybe your favorite player, right? Because it's built in us to, to honor. And sometimes we honor beyond and we start to worship. Next thing you know, we're showing up in the game looking like one of the players. I don't care about that. That's great. I have a couple of Seahawks shirts and everything. And the idea is we emulate after people. Don't do that. Emulate after Jesus. He's our model. Say amen. And eyes off yourself. Two really terrible things that happens to self is we can get depressed. People that suffer with depression, it's the worst kind of pride. Because where's their focus? 
yeah, and it's some, it's some it's a chemical thing, some it's a combinational thing, some it's the wrong focus. Anybody that focuses on the world, you're gonna get depressed. Hey, and if you focus on people, you're gonna get frustrated. Hello? You focus on yourself, <laughs> you wanna quit? But the Bible says, put our eyes on whom? Jesus. Why Jesus? How come not the Father? Because Jesus is our focus point. He says, if you're going to watch and know the Father, you've got to watch me. He said to Philip, Philip, you want to get to know the Father? He that has seen me has seen the Father. I'm just like him. I look like him. Smell like him. Operate that way. He speaks. I speak. He sees. I see. We move in tandem. So guess what? We focus on the Jesus part because Jesus then takes us up before the Father. You don't go before the Father on your own. You go through Christ. So this is what religious teachings don't teach you. They don't teach you how to be a spiritual individual because that's who we are. Look at your neighbor and say, you look pretty spiritual to me. All right. So. scripture up here in just a second, but I want to go over one more thing. Folks, when I was studying and when I was training for Safeway, I was a Safeway grocery deliverer before I, before I went full time here. So I worked, I worked full time and I also pastored full time. And I did that because Paul says, I, I'll make tents, I'll do anything where the people are not burdened. Okay, and so I did that for a while, and while I was doing that, when I was training, they sent me down to Pleasanton, California. I got to have lunch with my daughter. Amen, it was great. And then, then they took us on driving training, so they want you to drive the way they want you to drive, and not the way you think you should drive. And Christianity is that way. When you're going to a church, you do it the way the church has got it lined up. If it's not lined up with the word, then go find another church. But if your church is lined up with the word, don't do your own thing. Ask permission before you start doing things. And everybody's doing fine here with that. So let me just tell you, the name of this sermon is to be alert, sober, and awake, watchful. Can you say amen? And I'll go through it again. But so in this training, this is going to set the stage. In this training, we were each driver... We're all, we're to drive. And when they were driving, Seth, you'll get this. When you're driving, you're supposed to out loud acknowledge everything you see for alertness. Because our brain is half asleep, folks. How did you know? <laughs> and so here I'm driving along. I'm going to give you an example. I see three people at the crosswalk. The light's turning red. I see a car two cars behind me, and I'm talking all of this through. I got a van load of nine other drivers. Each one of us has to do this. You notice there's a crosswalk coming up. There's a light coming up on the left. I'm to take a left. I'm to go through here. Parking lot has five cars in it. I'm going to pass through there, and you're talking as you're driving. Why? Could you imagine doing that now? Because it has to do with alertness. God wants us alert. Do you believe that? But yet, the Bible talks about Christians sleeping while they're awake. Yeah. Zombie. You're a zombie. You're going through the motions, and you really don't know why. Don't do it. Don't do that. Anyway, so we had to acknowledge everything. Yeah, people walking up on the van. Somebody's on their phone. They shouldn't be on the right hand. Now we're at the stop sign, and there's 15 cars or more sitting, there, and we went through all of this alert, and every driver had to do that. And listen, the reason we want you to do that is we want you to mentally be alert on what you're doing. Slow down. Focus. Can you say amen? Slow down and focus. Get her done. But to do it properly and right. So many Christians, they get saved. Okay, I'm going to share with you. And then we're going to read our scripture. So when we get saved, do you know what God does? 
He puts a hedge around you. Hello? I'm going to talk about it for a while. I'm going to show you the scripture. Go Get ready to write this address down. Okay. He puts a hedge around you. So he will not be accused of putting, allowing you to be born in a fallen planet with an evil devil in it without some form of protection. Say, that's my father. That's my father. Make sure you know that. So every born again person has a hedge about them for a period of around three months before they start ripping it down with their words and with their actions and being mad at people and underlying and doing the things that we used to because we need to be cleaned up. God is hoping we get that injection. We use that time of protection that's all around us that Satan himself cannot trespass until we get Christ a little bit formed in us and we build a good habit so we can grow up. You know, the devil is really not as powerful as he's lied to us about. Well, I wouldn't mess with them. You don't have to. Just turn God loose on them. Why are you fighting in your own strength? Why don't you just release the name of Jesus and smack them in the face? See, we don't, we're not taught spiritual ways. We're taught religious ways. Where they don't fit the doctrine. I don't care. You're still getting trashed and your life's all a rotten pit. How about doing what the word says instead of the doctrine? Yeah. It's got to be the word. It can't be man's opinion of the word. So going back. So in Job, you ready to write this down? Chapter 1, verse 6 through 10. Actually about verse 12. It says, there was a day when the sons of God came in to present themselves before the Lord. Everyone say sons of God. Sons. Now remember when I told you about God. How many gods are there? One. In three yeah, the three original Elohims, the Father who's always been on the throne, never left the throne, the Word, now that's became flesh, now he's the Son of God, and then the Holy Spirit, say amen. It's called the Godhead, some people call it a trinity, but it's not there, but it's a Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, these three are one. So, inseparable, those are the, everyone say the original Elohim. Now, see, most Christians don't get a good explanation. I'm going to give you one. Please don't miss it. So there's three original Elohims. You mean in the very, 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 very beginning, there's only three? Yeah. And everything after that were God's creation. Say amen. amen. We get a picture of that on the mount with Moses. Moses is coming up to the mount. What does he see, folks? A burning bush. He's seeing God. God is life and branches and everything's living and it's on fire. Moses caught a glimpse of God's complete, creational, all-knowing, all-powerful plan. Say amen. A picture of it. A bush that's on fire but not consumed. Hi, bushes. You're on fire but not consumed. Come on now. I'm, I'm just beginning with you. So, your job is to keep the fire burning and keep the chaff out of your life. Say amen. If you start to stink, it's nobody else's fault. All right, so Moses saw a vision of it. Now, what you need to understand. So, going back to the original Elohim. Father, now the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came in amongst them. What? When did Satan get thrown out of heaven? Before Adam and Eve were created. Hello? Now, don't lose me here. I'm trying to tell you the gospel story, which has been avoiding you. Okay? You haven't known this story. So Satan is up there on Adam's authority because he stole the planet from Adam. He's up there wagging his tail, and, and God says, where do you come? And he said, from walking to and fro in the earth. What's he walking to and fro in the earth? Because Adam committed high treason and gave the earth to him. See, people don't understand that. That's why Satan is running rampant in here and the church is asleep. Because we're the only ones that tells us Satan where to go. Put him in his place. Our job, with God's help, to put him in his place. If we don't put him in his place, don't pray for your neighbor to do it. Okay? You have to keep this Satan out of your property, off of your children, off of that by your prayer life with God. Say amen. amen. So, Satan says, 
from walking to and fro in the earth. He says, now this is God talking. Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. See the word consider? It means, have you set your eyes like everybody else, Satan, to devour my servant Job? That's what the word consider means. Of course he did. He says, I can't do anything. This is, chap this is verse 10 to chapter 1. Because you've got a hedge about him. Now, folks, if the devil knows there's a hedge about us, about time we do. Yeah. And he says, I can't touch him with that hedge about him. But then God let us in on a little secret. Job's already in your power. We think God said, I turn him over to you to teach him a lesson. That's child abuse. I'll throw God in jail if he does that to me. Oh, how dare you talk like that? See, you don't know your God. You know about him. But once you spend time with God, you'll know that he cannot do one evil thing. He is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So how can we have perfect faith in a perfect God? By stop getting rid of all that other junk that floats around in our head that we think God is. Hello? So I can't touch him. you got to hedge about him. And God says he's already in your power. In other words, Job's been running around, goofing around with his Christianity. How many Christians do you know are playing games? Yeah. Partying and drinking and then going to church like they're so saved and sanctified. You're ripping your heads right down. Your protection's being ripped down. Yeah. When you gossip about others, you're ripping your heads down. When you talk about ministries, I don't care if you like them or not, don't talk about them. You're ripping your protection down, and Satan loves it. He'll keep encouraging you. Are you with me? Yeah. So, when you were first saved, you had a hedge about you, because when you got the age of accountability, you ripped it down, and you had to be born again. Say amen. Yeah. Then when you get born again, God puts another hedge around you. Sherry, that's what I told you about, that the three months probation period is about up. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Now you have to put to practice. You see, when I was a baby and I was in diapers, Mama took very good care of me. But when I start to grow, now I need to know when I go potty. <laughs> now I need to find out some things. So you look at society. Folks, please, don't, I'm, not, I'm not picking on anybody. I don't think I know everything. But folks, we're waking up. Right. Even right today. You go back 100 years and look at the church. The church is waking up. Yet we haven't woke up because we're blinded by religion. Yep. Religion blinds. Hello? Reads. 2 Corinthians, as long as the law and all the religion is read, there's a blinder put on people's face. But when one turns to the Lord, that blinder or veil is removed. Amen. So your veil has been removed, but if you go back into the religious fleshly practices, you'll put another blinder on yourself. Right. Satan won't do it. You'll do it to yourself. Yeah. You'll be walking around, oh, oh, oh. Listen, I do it funny. Listen, if, if you're blinded, how do you walk? By your feelings. Feelings. Nothing more than feel. You hurt my feelings. See how Satan sets us all up? Listen, you can call me every name in the book. I don't care. I'm dead in Christ and alive unto him. If you want to insult me, I already know you're in trouble. So call me every name in the book. I'll just say, God, sick them. Boom! Judgment hits them right away. I don't curse them. I don't do anything. I just say, God, fix that mess. Everyone say, God, fix my mess. Come on, say it like you mean it. God, fix my mess. There you go. You can feel the anointing going right in you. That's right. God needs your invitation. You can invite him in one day and forget about him the second. Don't do that. Oh, we got our scripture about ready to go up, don't we? Everyone say, thank you, Pastor Kerry, for that prelude. Okay, sorry. All right. So I want you to go with me to James chapter 1, please. We're going to call this, Be Alert, Sober, and Watchful. Let's look at our scripture. You ready? Can you read that? But the end of all things is at hand. How many know it's close? Therefore, be serious. Oh, and what? Watchful. 
You see, God has made me a watchman over several areas in the, in the United States. Montana and Idaho are one. In this Washington area, what's a watchman do? They, they hold things up in prayer, like a watchman over a wall, sees things and starts praying over those areas. Some of you are praying with BJ as she pulls out these cities and stuff. You're like a watchman. You're praying over those areas. Can you say amen? Okay. And to be watchful in your prayers. And above all things, be fervent, like a boiling point, fervent in love for one another. For love will cover, not expose, a multitude of sins. Hey, did you hear about the neighbor? You do that, you're going to get a curse on you. Be hospitable. What are we to be? Does this church fit that description? Are we hospitable? Yes, we are. Well, you guys got to be a little more confident. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Is there any more? Is that 10? Okay, great. Super. Okay. Be alert, sober, and watchful. You open your Bibles to James chapter 1. We're going to look at a couple of things, verse 16 and then through 18. And as you do this, let me just go ahead and share with you. God wants you to know that he sent his son to die for us, to go to hell, to rise again from the dead, to sit at the right hand of the Father, so that you might have protection from who? Who lives in this planet? Who thinks he's the God of this world? Yeah, and the Bible says that he dwells in the atmosphere you breathe, he dwells on the earth, and he dwells under the earth. That's why Jesus is Lord of things in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth. Because there are outlaws in all those areas. You get a chance to look at Cappadocia. Cappadocia is one of the places that have cities that are dug in the dirt. Out of solid rock, housed 20,000, 50,000, all through Turkey. The place of the Bible. Can you say amen? What were they hiding from? God's wrath. What happened? During the times of Noah, there was a little bit of angry God towards the, the, the sins of mankind, wasn't there? Yeah, yeah. yeah, do you believe in the flood? I believe. Yeah. yeah. And that, isn't that amazing? But you and I can, at any time, go buy salt from the Himalayas. If there wasn't a flood, where is there, why is there rock salt in the Himalayas? You see, we were left all of this for us to confirm our strength with God. But people have used it, and Satan has used it, to pick apart everybody's belief. Folks, you're not suffering because Satan is winning so, such a great thing over you. You're suffering because our mind are not renewed like it needs to be, and we still embrace some things that might not be true. So you want God to wash that out of you. Say amen. amen. How do you get God to wash that out of you? You ask him. Lord, wash out of me that's displeasing stuff. Take out of me things that displease you. Because yes. you can't do it. You don't decide one day you're going to quit doing something. No, God has to help you to quit doing the bad things. Hello? Yes. My voice is cracking. Maybe I'm in her in puberty. It's a joke. All right. All right, so let's, let's look at this. You got James? Okay, let's look at this. Do not be deceived. James chapter 1, verse 16. How come there's a lot of this deceiving warnings to us? Jesus warned us not to be deceived. People warn us not to be deceived. Why do you suppose all these warnings about being deceived? Because it's easy for a human to be Yes, that's why we have Jesus in a strong relationship with him, because he becomes our eyeglasses. Hello, the word of God becomes our eyeglasses to deception. Say amen. If you know the bridge is out, why drive over it? Oh, I just didn't know the devil made me do it. <laughs> no, you didn't listen to God, Bunky. All right. <coughs> A lot of rat dust, right, Seth? We cleaned out the back here. We're so, so great. What do you mean rat dust? Man, I tell you what, clean up time. I'm so excited. So let's look at this. James, be not deceived, my bro beloved brethren. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from where? God. Okay, so say God is per good and perfect. God is good so 
if something is happening in your life that's not good and perfect, do not blame it on God. God is putting me through this to teach me some kind of lesson. Folks, this is in 90% of the body of Christ. Bad teaching. The problem is it mixed the Old Testament with the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the people in the Old Testament didn't know what God was going to do. They knew they better please him or else. So they didn't know loving God. They had a judging God because there was something at stake most people don't realize. And that was the gospel of the birth of Jesus Christ and his bloodline. If the bloodline never came forth, you would never be saved. So God had to protect that bloodline above every human being. So if you got in the way, you got out of the way real quick. Because God has to bring a Messiah into the earth under Satan's nose so we can have redemption. Say amen. amen. That's the gospel story. You're in a giant rescue plan, not a big church with a big name. Yeah. Okay? You're in a God-fearing, God rescue plan, and you better hang around the ark. Because it's beginning to rain. Yeah. All right, so move. <laughs> All right. It says, God, the perfect gift comes from above. Now, and down from the Father of lights. Listen next. Of whom there is no variableness, nor shadow of what? That tells you that you need to know your God. If he's good and perfect, will he always be good and perfect? Yes. In his dealings with you, will they be good and perfect? Yes. So let me ask you. I love doing this. So, if God makes everything good and perfect, and he said in the beginning in Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Period. How were they? But we read in verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. <laughs> Most Christians go, well, well, I don't know what that is, but we'll just move right along. There you go. Overlooking to truth. Who's the author of chaos? Who's the author of darkness? Satan. Not God, Satan. So evidently between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, Satan fell to the planet and destroyed it. Hello? And you get a chance, let me give you a scripture, it'll tell you exactly what I just said, clear and plainly. That's Isaiah 45, verse 18. I did not create this planet void, and I did not create it with darkness. I created it to be inhabited. I am God, and there is no other. Isaiah 45, verse 18. So that tells us there's a line between our holy God, our loving God, and what... Morons are teaching about him. Right. You called somebody a moron. The original, I've been doing a lot of studying where phrases come out. The original phrase on moron means you're not using your head. It's not an insult. It just says, hey, you're not using your head. But see, then it got stretched and became some kind of weird thing, you know, like people do. Always making things a little weirder than they are. Hello? Yeah. So you're with me. So, does God change? No. Jesus Christ the same yes. yesterday, today, and forever. So where's this changing come from? This is Satan's lies about God. Remember, Antichrist doesn't just mean against Christ. It means instead of Christ. New Age, other religions. Huh? Hello? Satan's little goops, his little tricks. This is a planet full of traps and tests and problems. Well, why is it like that? Because Adam gave in to the devil in the first place. God gave the planet to Adam. Adam committed high treason. And because of that, God said, okay, Satan, you can stay, but my children will, will choose me and not you. So God didn't leave the devil in the planet because he wanted to test his children. He left them in the planet because legally he had to. Because we have to kick him out of our life. Not God. He's already kicked him out. 
Now you take God in you and kick him out of your family, out of your job, off your husband, your wife. You kick him off of your children and you say, Father, you promised me as me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord and hold God to his promises and he'll move heaven and earth for his kids. Remember, we're living in front of Satan. Don't you think God gets tickled when he blesses you in front of that little snaggle tooth? Absolutely. Yeah, when you're dancing around going, woohoo, thank you, God. It's ripping him apart because he wants to be worshipped. He wants to be served. He wants to turn the human race into a slave mining race. So you got to know your Bible. Folks, if you know anything about Satan, he was changing the DNA of man ever since the beginning. So he could have a race of creatures called the cro magnum man and all the magna Duganaga that they dug up. Does God make things perfect? Well, where did the cro magnum man come from? He made him. The devil tried to make a man and failed. All those bones and stuff they're finding is his creations. Our creation, now listen to me. Our creation has a mark in your DNA that has God's initials on it. Everything else that didn't originate from God doesn't have that mark. So they're unredeemable. Say unredeemable. unredeemable. The devil cannot be saved. He's unredeemable. His offspring and his perversions that he has created in the planet, we see all kinds of structures by them, cannot be redeemed. That's why Noah's flood, he got rid of them. And some of the equipment. Although they buried some of the equipment, now they're flying around with it. Oh, I don't believe in them. Those are demons flying those things around. But where'd they get the machinery? They're flying machines around because our government has them. How do you know, Pastor Kerry? Because I have connections. <laughs> and I can't tell you more. I'll have to kill you. All right? So let's not go on past that. You ready? We're going to cover these four things. You're kidding me. This is all I ever normally get at church. That's why you're starving to death and you're operating out of physical naturalness. You want to be spiritual every day of your life. Say amen. And God will help you to do that. So we're going to cover these four areas. Say amen. Number one, we're going to teach you about stay alert and stay within your hedge. Folks, we teach it as an umbrella. How many's ever seen those umbrellas that go all the way down to the ground and have a little, a little window in them when the rain's coming sideways? How many's ever seen one? Maybe a giant umbrella where it comes down big. How many know that the umbrella is to protect you, right? And if you want to get wet, what do you do? You get out from the... Uh, so here, here's the scripture. It rains on the just and the unjust. No, it just rains. And the unjust are out there on their own. And you are under the grace umbrella of God. Stay within the hedge. Say amen. Learn what you is good for you. Now listen, this is Romans 12. Learn what is good for you, what is acceptable for you, and what is the perfect will of God. 30, 60, and 100 pulls. Say amen. You're, you're learning what is good and what is acceptable and then what is not, because there are times God will say, I don't want you doing that anymore. Say, oh me. oh, me. God will tell you, don't do that anymore. Don't disobey him, because he's telling you, because the enemy's got a little plan of wiping you out if you do. So when God tells you don't, it's for your benefit, because the enemy's got some kind of plan. Say, me. Oh me, oh my, oh me, oh me, oh my. All right, so we're covering these four things. Stay alert within your heads too. Don't be drawn away or distracted. Folks, let me tell you, Satan always uses the flashy flash. The dingling, the, the glitter, the boom. Our whole society is built on Hollywood and entertainment. Glash, kavush, kavash, kavish, flashy, flashy. How many know God's so far out of class and so flashy? But you know God doesn't flash himself. Satan is a, is a flasher. <laughs> He's always flashing to get your attention. Don't look over there. Look over here. Don't look there. Look over here. And so if you're one of those easily distracted people, you're going to be looking everywhere but where you should be looking. 
unto the author and the finisher of our faith. Folks, going through a trial, be quiet, keep your eyes on Jesus. Going through a trial, be quiet, keep your eyes on Jesus. The temptation is for you to talk about it. When you start talking about it, Satan gets wind and he starts blowing fire into that problem. Don't strip him right off. Recognize that Satan literally had the ball always in his, uh, he thinks he has it in his court, but Jesus has the ball and he owns the court. And you're his kids. So it's time we get closer to God and stop being religious. Amen. Just because I don't belong to your denomination doesn't mean I'm not saved. Right. But some people believe that. And how many know God doesn't want us divided? Right. He doesn't want us indecisive. Right. He doesn't want us opposing one another. Right. He wants us unified. Yeah. United we stand, divided we what? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, Pastor, what do you think about that church up the street? I think they're blessed. I think God wants to work them. You're not going to get anything more out of me than that. I'm not going to go in detail and say, well, they should be preaching this and they should be preaching. When you start doing that, you're stripping your hedge. Yeah. Put down the chainsaw and stop cutting up your hedge. You still love me. Okay, third thing we'll cover, don't let your mouth betray you. Did you know this is where your big betrayer is? And then finally, we're going to cover this. And I'm going to go through quickly, so take notes, please. And then always return to the charging station, God. This is where Christians miss it. Daily, the first person you should say hi to in the morning is, Why? Because he's running your life. Okay? Now, we call him Lord, don't we? So, does he run your life? Yes. Okay, good. Because if he doesn't, don't call him Lord. Because Jesus says, don't call me Lord if you can't do anything I ask you to. Jesus. Luke 6, 46 through 49. Hello? Are you with me? All right, so let's, let's kind of look at this, all right? Always return to your docking station, Jesus. Why? Because if without doing that on a daily basis, you're going to get out of phase. Everyone say, out of phase. How many ever watched a guitar play? Somebody playing a beautiful guitar, and then they're strumming it, and they're doing that. But if the guitar goes out of tune, it's out of phase. Folks, you have to be in phase daily, so you have to meet with God first thing daily, so he tunes you, he pumps you up, fills you, and puts you into phase. Then he clothes you, and then says, go out and get them, kids. What do we do? Immediately, we put our eyes on the world, what's not working for us. We are all so centered on ourselves, and nothing seems to work, and we go, God, it's not working for me. And God says, you're not doing what I said. You're not even beginning to practice what I said. You missed the whole thing. Because you assumed you know. Don't assume you know anything before God. Assume you don't know a thing and have him reteach you sometimes. Say, oh me. Oh, me. Okay. All right, first point. Stay alert within God's head. First Peter chapter 5, please. We're going to look at a beautiful scripture. You guys all know it. Starting at verse 5 through 9. Likewise, you younger, submit to yourselves to the elders. Peggy, she's an elder, not in the church. So you don't get all that messed up. She's been saved a long time. That's what that means. Okay? It means those that have been saved a long time, respect them. Okay? And so we know there are elders in church and deacons in church. That's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about respect the ones that have been with Jesus longer and learn from them. Yeah. Submit the younger to the elders. All of you be in submission to one another. You see, each one of you are a wonderful gift. Can the hand say to the foot, I have no need of you? Can the eye say to the, the, the hand, I have no need of you? No, but God has put all these things in the church to glorify him as he pleases. So it goes on further to say, yes, all of you be submissive to one another, be clothed with humility. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. 
Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. You see, when God lifts us up, he comes up under us, so you can't fall off of something. But when you lift yourself up, it's like falling off a ladder. I know I did. Everybody had me so high, and the, they would come along and touch my clothes. Oh, man, come on, you know, you were there. I'd have people going around with their Bible and say, bless my Bible. That was back in the days when the revival was going everywhere. People were getting on fire. That was 20, 25, 30, 40 years ago. And to me, it just drove me nuts because I'm nobody special. You're nobody special. We're together the children of God. Can you say amen? Children of light. So don't put a human being on a pedestal because it's a created being. Put the creator there and keep him there. Goes on further to say, look at submissive one to another and be clothed with humility for God resists the proud and give grace to the humble. Folks, every part of your problem is not coming from your spirit man where God lives. It's coming from your flesh. So which has the pride in it? Flesh. flesh. Don't you say that to me. Pride. Oh, I could do that. Pride. I'm going to do it my way. Pride. God resists the... So Satan knows he can move you out of loving God into yourself and you're going to display pride and the Holy Spirit has to stop because he can't bless garbage. And our flesh is garbage. Oh, Pastor Curry, why are you saying that? Because Paul said it in Romans 7. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin? So we submit it to God so he can bathe it, clean it, and wash it. Say amen. <laughs> When's the last time you took a time to be with God? All right, so moving right along. So therefore, humble yourself, so we have to do it, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care, all your worries, anxieties, over on the Lord, for he cares for you. Say amen. amen. Then it says, be sober, be vigilant, or watchful because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion walks about what walks about what your hedge and he walks about your edge because he's too stupid to know it automatically he has to walk around your life looking to what part you rip down and sometimes that takes months for him to figure it out Sometimes it takes overnight because you flag them with your lips. All right, stay within your hedge, protect it, watch what you talk about, because your hedge will grow and become stronger and thicker and more out diameter. I walked about with my hedge being 100 feet in diameter around me, and even Scott would tell you, you get, people got around me, they started falling over in the spirit. That isn't anything special because of me. you got to know what the principles are so that you can keep working with them. And consistency, Sherry, and Sherry will tell you, will cause growth in the protection God has given to you. Say amen. amen. Don't tear down your hedge. Do not say, I'll do this, and then don't. You're tearing down your hedge. If you gave your word, the Bible says keep your word, even to your own hurt, and pay the difference. Hello? So that you don't tear down your hedge. Everything I share with you is to protect and to give you what you need so you can apply it so that you are very blessed people. You know, you don't need to tell people you're blessed. They can see it on you. So if you like to see that on other people, ask God to change you too. Some of your countenances are, are, are not as high as they need to be. What's a countenance? That's the light shining out of you. You get with God and he charges your batteries. So listen, if your light's not coming out of you, the devil thinks he's already got you. It's the light that scares him to death. So let your light shine before and okay, so, so everyone stay, stay within the hedge. Okay. 
So we're to humble ourselves, cast all our cares over it, be sober, be vigilant, because the adversary is walking around our edge, seeing whom he may devour. Then what does it say? Resist him. Now, the word resist means to be quiet, don't say anything, and act like he's not around. Can you do that under trial? It takes a little bit of God's help to do that. Have a poker face. You feel like all hell's breaking loose on you, but you know God's inside of you. You have peace. Get your eyes off all the stuff around you. Keep under your hedge and just start praising him. Lord, I thank you. This is not the end of things. Thank you. This is a beginning of things. Oh, thank you. And our focus stays on you, Lord. Right? Instead of everything. Flashy, flashy, flashy. Look here, look here. And then your Christianity reflects the confusion of where you're staring that you shouldn't. Say, well, me. Couple of points. Number one, the system that we are living in is corrupted. It cannot teach humility and show us the way to walk. How many know the world can't do that to you? So why are we sending our kids into the world hoping we are going to learn? Moms and dads, teach your children. Grandparents, teach your children. Say amen. Interview them. Don't be sitting around, oh, your child comes to you, I got a special friend, I got an invisible friend. You better be finding out who that invisible friend is. I had invisible friends too, taught me all the wrong things. We need to be sharp and alert, not nervous or worried. Because when you walk with God, you meet with God, he gives you his wisdom. You don't have to come up with it. Right. It just comes out of you. Yep. Gosh, sakes, it's so good. Yeah. There's somebody here with a knot on their back, right in the top of their, it, it just popped. Just move your head like that. You'll hear a little cup crack. Boo! It just popped out off you. Woo. Raise your hands if that was you. Go ahead. Somebody in here. Hey, Amen. Raise your hands. <laughs> Somebody didn't die up. Oh, maybe they did. Okay. The system is corrupted, so don't put your faith in it. Amen. Two, in the church, we submit to one another. We don't order each other around. You're going to be a leader, then you lead by example. Don't want to be a leader and show up late all the time. Now, I'm not picking on the late people, okay? Oh, he's picking on me. See, they are in the flesh already. If you're going to be a leader, you have to lead by example. Hello. That means you could be head of the game by God's power. Say amen. amen. Don't tell people to be on time and you can never show up. That's what we had in the church for the last 20 years. You can't count on my word and I promise you, let's have lunch and you never see him again. What I'm trying to do, tell you is uh, we can't behave religiously. It's not going to work anymore. Say amen. amen. Let your yea be yea and your nay be. Amen. Anything more than that is from the evil one, the Bible says. That's Jesus' words. Let's go to the next point I want to give you. I done preached myself happy. I forgot my water, though. Third thing is we are to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. Folks, a police officer doesn't have a power to physically stop a car. But he, by the jurisdiction of the city, can blow a whistle and stop cars. You're the same way. You can't physically stop the devil. That's why you don't fight in your own strength. You release God. One of the things that always worked, when Satan used to bother me a lot before I knew these things, he would just kind of sit on my shoulder and just lie, 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 lie. And, I'd say, ah. <laughs> and finally God says, why don't you just tell him he's going to hell? So I said, Satan, did you know you're going to hell? And I'm going to be right there when you fall in. So if you're going to remind me about my past, I'm going to remind you about your future. And as soon as you start talking like that, he leaves. But we don't talk that way. We talk in our head. <laughs> Since when does it say confess with your head the Lord Jesus Christ? This makes the covenant legal. 
When you say, I Father, in Jesus' name, the covenant is completely in operation. All of heaven stands in wait to hear what you're going to say. And you think your way through things. Here, let me pray for you, Seth. Are you getting the vibes? And I'm telling you, there are so many Christians that th are convinced by the devil they can pray in their head. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, you can, and God actually hears you. But there's no power in it. It's all substantive. Hello? And how many times have your head changed your mind while you're trying to pray in it? <laughs> Come on. Come. You see, and if, if my little phrases and weirdness when I do that assaults you, you're in the flesh. Stop that. Say, you're already vulnerable. Satan will set you up every day. Somebody will say something or do something to irritate you. You've got to die to yourself. You could call my name, my, mom, my mama's in every name in the book, and I'll look at you, and you know she's in heaven. Why don't you try to get there to talk with her about it? You see, none of that intimidation bothers me anymore because you cannot irritate a dead man. And I died to Jesus, I mean, died to the flesh daily and lived to Jesus daily. You have to do the same. Otherwise, you're going to be religious and irritated all the time. Hello. Look at your neighbor and say, I think he might have my number. Okay. All right, so here's another thing. Satan uses everything to draw us away from focusing on God. So second point, don't be drawn away. I'm just going to use those 10 rules. Go with me to James 1, look at verse 12 through 15, uh, 15 or 16. Yeah, 16. Let me know when you got it. I'm going to sneak down and grab my water. You'll notice since I've been pre uh, preaching and stuff, my health is getting better. I don't cough as much. All these things happened. When we went through the COVID, I mean, I got this breathing stuff and all that kind of thing and coughing and smoke. You know, it sounded like I smoked two packs a day. <laughs> I, not really. Not at all. But see, you know, you know, that kind of stuff. But when you stay with the Lord, it cleans all that out of you. Hello? How many here love a good fresh shower? And you got a shower that works the way you want it to work? You know, and it just... Whoosh. Every day when you meet with God, let it be a refreshing shower. Let him charge you. Let him tune you. Lay your flesh down and say, God, crucify it. So when I walk out of here, you'll see Jesus and not my flesh. Talk to God that way. He loves it. Remember, Jesus lived among people for 33 and a half years. And they got to touch him and, and watch him and look at him. Read 1 John chapter 1, 1 through 5. We seen him, we held him, we touched him, and it keeps on reverberating through us. Amen. So don't be drawn away. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures what? Okay, folks, as long as you are in this planet, the tempter is going to come to you. Everyone say, oh, that's his job. Did, did the tempter come to Jesus? So do you, are you any better than Jesus? Here's how the tempter knows to come to you. He knows that when you switch from your walking in the spirit to the flesh, he knows he can appeal to your flesh. Because your flesh has been programmed by him since you were a wee high to a grasshopper. He has put stuff in your head all your youth. And so is God. And he's got little trigger points. So he comes to you as a tempter, and he says, Ah, would you like to trade your salvation behind curtain number one? It's $12 million and a couple of ladies on the side on a hidden island. Would you like to trade your salvation for that? And so he brings these temptations up. I, I, I chose a ridiculous one. Hello? And he brings them up to disqualify us to cause us to have guilt again, to cause us to feel condemned again. Never by God, never should be by others. But Satan, as soon as he talks you into something, he'll give you guilt and condemnation. God gives conviction, not guilt and condemnation. Jesus died to remove that from us. Say amen. So look what it says. It goes on, and he says, 
For when he has approved, once he passed that temptation, he'll receive a crown of life to which the Lord has promised to those that love him. Verse 13 is a warning. Let no man send way is tempted. I am tempted by God. What? Yeah. So why are Christians say God put that tree of good and evil in the garden to test his kids? That's from hell. If you read it carefully, God did not put that tree in the garden. He put a good tree if he put any tree there. Because God is good and perfect. So you got to really, you have to really look at this. So half the church is saying, God put that there to prove our loyalty to God. Bunk. If my God did that to me, I'd probably be just like Adam. Mess everything up. But God did not put that tree there because God is all good. He has no evil. So he couldn't put that there. See, why aren't we going back to the good and perfect God? Because Satan doesn't want us to use that as eyeglasses. He wants us to see an imperfect God who does whatever he wants. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. Your future's not yours to see. <laughs> que sera, sera. And that's what all the world is doing. Oh, whatever comes our way, God's got to go through God's desk, and he has to put a stamp of approval. That's from hell. Yeah. God does not approve the devil to beat the tar out of his kids so they'll love him more. That is a double-minded God, unstable in all his ways. Now, get mad at me if you will. I will not betray my God's perfection for some man's doctrine. Thank you for that week, amen, but thank you. <laughs> so don't be drawn away. But every man, listen to this, verse 13, let no man send when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Now, why does it say that? James is telling you who lives in you. Amen. Who lives in the born-again believer? Come on, say, God. God. Can God be tempted? No. So why aren't you letting him run your life? Because if you stop getting, start getting tempted, remember the garden when Jesus said, pray with me one hour, will you? He says, because your spirit's willing, but your flesh is weak. Yes. Don't be in the flesh as a Christian. Get out of it as quick as you can. Amen. You having a bad attitude, stop everything. Go pray. Don't ride that bad attitude through the day. What are you, a hedge ripper? Guaranteed. Here's another thing. That hedge is so powerful, if another Christian starts attacking you, that hedge will rip on them. That's what Satan does. He gets two wonderful Christians to oppose them, one from a denomination, one from another denomination. That's why they're denominated. <laughs> and they're bashing each other with their edge. Yeah. Come on, grow up, church of God. Yeah. Man, there's a revival that's here, and we won't catch the wind of it until we strip ourselves of all that foolishness and follow God. Say amen. I've done preach myself happy. It's not what you hear. It's what you catch. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> People aren't listening anymore. They think they know it, so they think they hear it, and yet it wasn't said that way at all. Man, that's so anointed up here. Okay, so it's because of God, though. All right, so don't let drawn away. But every man, look at the last part. But each one is tempted when he's drawn by his own desires or lusts. What part of you has the lusts in it? What part of you needs to straighten that, that kind of thinking? They had. But Satan knows exactly when to come at us. Okay, number one, because their countenance is down. Your countenance is the light that shines off of you. So if you're negative and down and out for a while, your countenance will be down. So Satan says, there's no light, let's attack. Another thing, when people are negative, they put off a scent. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says there's a scent of life and there's a scent of death. When Christians are negative, you've been around people that are welfare mentality, and they don't bother to give, they're take, 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 and their lives are falling apart. You go into that place, it smells. God doesn't have any putrid smell. Can you say amen? But I'm not talking about physical. You're thinking I'm talking, I'm talking about spiritual. There's a spiritual scent we produce when we're negative and when we attack one another. And Satan picks up on it. He's called Beelzebub. Everyone can say Beelzebub. Prince of the flies. Folks, you got fish in your kitchen garbage. You left for two days. You didn't dump it. You're going to have the prince of the flies show up. Folks, let me... When you are negative, you don't present yourself to God on a daily basis, there's going to be a certain amount of stench that's going to come off you. Now, I'm not picking on you. It just does. Nastiness and... and blah, blah, blah. I, hey, I would love you to come to church with me. Oh, you're always on my case. <laughs> and then the, the prince of the fly goes, oh, I can get him. Yeah, he's easy, easy, snare, easy smelling, easy pickings. Another thing he listens to. You know, once in a while, the devil listens to your conversation? Huh? How you doing? Oh, pretty good under the circumstances. <laughs> yeah. So what he's, he picks up, not, not right away, but he will eventually pick that up. Because people who talk like that, they're in the habit of talking like that. And when you're in the habit of doing that, you need to get out of that habit. Because you're going to flag the devil down. He's going to come and poop in your head. Hey, I've had, we've had some beautiful brothers and sisters who were wonderful, but they entertained the poop in their head, and it corrupted them. So you be really clear. The reason I'm using that term, it's a, you know, is because that's what the devil does. He lays on you. He, he begins to lie to you, and you entertain that. And that's just all excrement. It's all awful. And you're dwelling, next thing you know, you've, yeah, he looks like he's mad at me. <laughs> and he plays us. Yeah. I've got a great skit I'm going to do here coming up. And I'm going to take you fishing. And we're going to have a good time. I'm going to show you how you can, in all your ways, acknowledge him. And we're going to take you on a fishing. This is going to go, and I'm going to be sitting on a rock fishing. And teaching you some things about using the right bait and the right hook. Make sure your bait doesn't have B-O. <laughs> All right, moving right along. Do you love me? All right, good. Let's, let's go into some more of this. So, easily, every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lusts and enticed. Remember the flashy, flashy, flashy. I can tell you times, I don't go into much detail, why I've been at a great, you know, great meeting of God, where the power of God, and immediately Satan gets one of his best temptations to try to bring it your way. Don't be surprised at that. Just rebuke it. Hello? One time we were down witnessing in Tacoma, and we were walking the streets back in the old days when the pornographic books and everything was right out on, the, on Pacific Avenue. And back behind in commerce was even worse. And I took a team down there to witness. And in fact, I'd like to take a team with you. We'll go down there and do some witnessing if you like. And uh, feeding some homeless people maybe. And we was walking down the street. And that was back in the days where the, the, front, the, the storefronts were indented. Remember, we had the street front, and then the doors went in, and then there was a door, so there was an opening in here. And a lot of people would hide out in there. So I'm walking down the street, and there was a guy. He looked like a druid. He had long hair and, and an animal coat and a big, huge cane with a devil's face on it. I mean, a, a, a staff and everything like that. And I walked by, and I said, you! I do crazy things. And I said, you! And he, and he goes like that. I said, what are you doing here? I mean, I'm just filled with God. Now listen, I want to encourage you. He says, I came down because something woke me up and told me to come down here. I says, God woke you up and I was coming. Would you like to have God in your heart instead of the devil? He said, would I? And he fell down to his feet, dropped the cane, and then some of our team started walking around and cried out to God. 
What did that? Me? No, the anointing on me. The anointing on you. So let's get you so stinking full of the anointing that it does the work for you. Amen. So he just fell down. You know, he turned into my radio announcer. <laughs> and he followed me to the mission field. And he's living for God today in Hawaii. Now, did I do that? No. So get your eyes off of this plane and put them a little higher and say, God, today it's an adventure with me and you. Lead the way, my God. When you start talking with God that way, he'll start ordering your steps and you'll be most amazed. You could do something with a donkey like me. <laughs> All right, so let's go on. So listen, you're... Focus, stay the course, focus, stay the course, focus, stay. Well, I, I feel kind of weird. Focus, stay the course. It doesn't matter what you feel. It's focus because God is growing you up out of yourself and turning you into a champion. Say amen. amen. Go to our third point. Don't allow our mouth to betray us. Folks, you know that your mouth is not your friend. There's two fountains out of here. One's a bitter fountain from your flesh unrenewed mind. The other is a sweet fountain from the spirit in your born again spirit man. You were born again in your spirit man. Not your head. Okay. So your spirit man has a sweet fountain in it. Jesus spoke about the woman at the well. He says if you drink of this water you're going to thirst again but you drink the water I give you. Will be in you a wellspring of water springing up to everlasting. He was talking about being born again. And then in the seventh chapter, he says, all of you, in this great mighty day of the feast, they stood up and he says, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, for out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spoke he of the spirit, which has not been given yet, but will come at Pentecost. Can you say amen? Woo, it's nice to understand the word, isn't it? So let's go on. Don't allow your mouth to betray us. James chapter 3, please, 1 through 5. James 3, 1 through 5. Whole chapter on the mouth. But I put up, brought out the positive. Say amen. My brethren, let not, let not many of you, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers. Why? Because out of a multitude of words, you can really slip up. So a teacher isn't something that you want to be. It's something God makes you. Amen. All of us teach something. You taught to your children, all kinds of... But what are you teaching? When people look at your life, what is your life saying? I'm un together, I'm unraveled, or I'm a mighty man or woman of God. And we do that by following Jesus. Say amen. My brethren... Not let not many of you try to be teachers, knowing that they s shall receive a stricter judgment. For we are all stumble in many things. If any man does, now listen, if any man does not stumble in word, he is a perfect or mature man, able to bridle his whole body. Oh, my, you want to lose weight? Watch how you talk. Carrie, how did you lose? I got a picture of myself, 325 pounds. I looked so awful, yet I was so happy. <laughs> anyway, I said, God, I need to lose weight. And he says, son, you won't be able to do it unless I help you. So most people rush off and they get on a diet, they do this, but they don't bother to pray and ask me to help them. So he began to show me. He says, when you sit up at a meal, you put on your plate what I want you to. Don't worry, son. This is God talking to me. I'll give you plenty you like. But if you do it, you're going to mess up because the enemy is going to make you lust after what you like and you're going to take too much. So listen to God. He says, drink at least a uh, glass of water before you eat so your, bo your body is tricked. So when you eat, you're full quicker and you're satisfied faster. And then he began to walk me through it. And it took a, a two to three years. But... I weigh 179 pounds. Wow! And I didn't do any of it, but, but obeyed God. 
I really want it always my life. Maybe you would want this too, to hear God's voice, to obey him, and even the little things so that my life is a success. And at least somehow my life would be a blessing and an encouragement to someone else. Us to all of us. You're beautiful people. Don't let the devil molest you. That's what he does when you believe his lies. He's molesting you. Now, women, you know what that's like. For us guys, I loved it. I was a, a molested kid all my life. Horrible. All the neighbor girls knew all about me. Now, who do you think set something up like that? Yes. To try to get me to be corrupted before I reach ministry. Same with you. You can go back in your past and see all the weird things that happened to try to keep you from following Christ. That's why they happened. To try to get you to die before your time. Or at least corrupt yourself. You want to scare somebody that's a, one of those JBTA, B-bomb, boom, whatever they are? Tell them, it says, did you know that if you continue a lifestyle like that, your DNA will change and you won't be able to go to heaven. So if you want to stay gay and you want to stay some kind of perversion, go ahead. But you're not going to irritate me and I'm certainly not going to vote you into office. Amen. I'm an American citizen and I plainly can see what's of the devil and what's not. Say amen, somebody. Amen. So what's James say? It says, you can take your word and you can control your body. So has your body been out of control? Then say, Lord, teach me how to use my mouth correctly. So I don't say what I don't need to say and I say what I need to say. Let me speak in faith, not in fear. Say amen. And there's faith for things that should be, and there's faith for things that could be. You choose, because both are your choice. So don't ladder our mouths of faith. Go with me to Ecclesiastics. This is a cute one. In Ecclesiastics, Old Testament, verse 1 and 2, look at this one. How many has ever seen somebody come into church and make a spectacle out of themselves? Don't raise your hand. This is a little advice. When you walk into the house of God, get a hold of your mouth. Can you say amen? Yeah. Do not insult people. God's people do not do things like that. Your head will be ripped down so fast and you'll become bait to the devil. Once the head gets down, then you start becoming defensive. Folks, we're supposed to stay on the offense. We're rushing forward and taking land, kicking butt and getting names. Can you say amen? amen? We're not to be receded and afraid because then we lose. We're on the defense. We already won. How many years ago did Jesus kick the devil? Over 2,000 years ago. Who lives in your heart? Jesus. So let him run your life so the devil's afraid of him, not you. See, Satan, you come at me, you're going to have to go through God. Bible says I'm hidden in Christ in God. So he's going to have to pull me out of God to get to me. And that's where these Christians say, well, why is this happening to me? Because you are in the flesh, you got yourself out of your head, and you became a flag to the devil, and he finally got you. And you go, why, oh, why, oh, why? And God says, oh, you, oh, you. You need to be listening to me. Okay. All right. So I'm meddling up. So listen, Ecclesiastes, look at verse 1. Walk prudently or uprightly when you go into the house of God. Draw near to hear rather than give the sacrifice of fools. What's the sacrifice of fools? Multitude of words. Okay. All right. For they do not know that they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Everyone say, Amen. Amen. Under trial, be quiet. Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry. People who speak a lot are emotionally 
unstable, and they'll get angry quick, too. Be quick to hear, slow to speak. A soft answer turns away wrath. Let's go down to our next point. All right, don't let your mouth betray you. How you doing? I'm, I'm blessed because of God. Isn't that cool? How you doing? Well, it's been a rough week. Let me just tell you about it. Don't do that. I already can tell by looking at you. But don't let the devil in on it. He's not always present. Sometimes he's present when you speak. Do you know the devil does come to church? It sits in the pew, tries to pick on my fault, and then he arrests on any weak-willed person who will listen to him. And they'll end up doing something terrible, and the devil won't let him return. I've got a brother that I love so much he, that he won't even let me get close to him to help him. So somebody else has got to go and represent the Lord to rescue him. I have to turn the page. All right. Go with me to 1 John chapter 5 in the same point. In the same point. Don't let your mouth betray you. In 1 John 5, verse 18 and 19. Almost done with you. All right. How many are born of God? Amen. If God's running your life, he's going to run your life from the inside out, not from the outside in. You're going to have to learn to walk with him. And don't say you're an expert now if your life is trashed. Learn to walk with them and let us encourage you. We're not, Pastor Kerry's not going to pick on your faults. You got plenty of them. I'm going to encourage you to grow up out of yourself so that you can be pleased in what God's doing in your life. Say amen. amen. Pleased in what God is doing in your life. You don't have to say anything about God. It just projects off you. But please do talk about God all the time. So go on. Look what it says. We know whoever's born of God does not what? Yeah. Who lives in your spirit? Jesus. Can God sin? No. So what he, John is saying is he's giving us a secret to his walk with Christ. Did you know John is the only one that they could not kill? They killed all the other disciples. But John, they put him in a vat of boiling oil. He just played in the oil all day long. He didn't burn at all. They kept throwing more fire. So they stuck him on an island full of rocks, hoping that would wear him out. He started getting the soldiers saved. John is passing to us something that you really need to pay attention to. He who is born again does not sin. Or he who is born again does not practice doing the same stupid things over and over again. Hello? You see, when I was a child, I acted like a child. I talked like a child. I did childish things. But when I became a God man, I put away those childish things. I lay aside those weights and sins that so easily beset me. And I run with endurance, race set before me, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith. So he that's born of God won't continue to practice sin because God will go off in you and say, stop doing that. Stop doing that. So what will happen is you'll have to stay away from church to justify what you're doing. Because you've got something inside you. So stop doing that. His name is God. So he's born of God, does not practice sin. Here in your head, yeah, in your flesh, oh, whatever you can get away with. But if you walk from your spirit, man, from the inside out, you will literally get better every day, and you'll, these sin things and these wasteful things start dropping off of you Amen. like barnacles. He says, and whoever is born of God keeps himself. Where? Where does he keep himself? What have we been learning? You keep yourself within your hedge. God is not going to call you outside of your hedge to do something for him. He's going to call you and your hedge to go into all the world and rip apart the kingdom of darkness. Get up in the morning, you've got a complete hedge right around you, a complete wall of protection. Watch what you say, because you're the only one that can rip that wall down. Satan cannot. 
I said the devil cannot. Amen. So he appeals by yelling over the wall, hey, stupid, why don't you do this? Why did you do that? And over from the wall, he's, he's projecting his voice. And, and we think, well, maybe I am stupid. And maybe I, and then the walls start coming down. Don't let the enemy do that to you, okay? None of us are intelligent. <laughs> so just accept it and say, all my intelligence come from God. I said this a while ago. I want you to really meditate on it. Do you think we have ever come up with an original idea ourselves? What do you think? No, everything is not new under the sun. So you'll, feel, you'll see things come in cycles and different things. Our job is to catch those things as God leads us. Satan doesn't want us to see any of that. Hello. You already won in Christ. You already finished in Christ. You already have the kingdom dwelling in you in Christ. So how is the devil getting to us? He's calling us, he's drawing us away into other things. So we'll rip down our protective hedge. Someone look at your neighbor and say, not me. I'm not that dumb. Now you're beginning to see the quality of what God has given us and not to become religious. Okay? Walk with him. All right. Last point. Thank God. All right. Just like return daily to your charging station. Folks, the Bible says if you're going to follow Christ, you have to first deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. In other words, deny your selfishness, take up your death, your death in Christ. That's what a cross is. Your death in Christ, die daily and follow him. You see, the only thing that will keep us from being successful and following is the part we don't crucify. The areas that you're having trouble in our lives, any one of us, are the areas you have not submitted to God and have a crucify. So the enemy keeps popping those things up on you. So say, Lord, help me crucify this. Then it goes on. Oh, Lord, thank you. All right, so Matthew 11, this is very familiar, 27 through 30. Who is our focal point? Jesus. Don't say God. It's too general. Jesus is your focal point. You are to be focusing on him. Jesus said, have you seen me? You've seen the? Father. And if you've seen him, you've seen the spirit. So we focus on the one we can focus on, the one that came in sinful flesh yet without sin, Jesus. His job is then to take us in the spirit and bring us before the Father, move us in the spirit. So if we're not focused on Christ, then we're disobeying the word because it's looking unto the author and the finisher of our faith. Didn't say it was the Father, said it was Jesus because he's the active part working with the Holy Spirit in the earth. Focus on me. Everyone say, I'm a Polaroid camera. Remember those? Point, click. Bzzz. What came out on the film? Whatever you pointed it at. So if you're looking at problems all the time and you go point, click, what's going to come on the film? Tell your husband, could focus in on the problems. He goes point, click, bzzz. point, click, bzzz. point, click, bzzz. How about focusing on the word? Point, click, woo. Point click, yeah, point click, wonderful. Because whatever you focus on, you're going to produce. And if it's filth, you're going to be filthy. Moving right along. Okay, you with me? All things have been delivered to me, Jesus said, by my Father. And no one knows the Son except for the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And the one to whom, listen, the Son will reveal him. Come to me. I'm going to reveal the Father to you. Come to me. I'm going to show you how to walk the kingdom. Come to me, all you that are heavy laden with the world's sin and nature that's pressing down and crushing you. 
Come to me. I am your rest. Come to me. I am your rejuvenation. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me. In other words, connect to Jesus. Necktie yourself to him. Belt up to Jesus and let him take the lead. In olden days, it, it doesn't, it just takes a long time to explain. They get a brand new uh, donkey connected with a well-used, well-trained donkey, and the new donkey learns all the good ropes. Today, we've got a bunch of yahoos leading the church, so how are you going to connect to those donkeys? You can't. You connect to Jesus. He's your model. And you get so close to him that everything he says, you hear. His job is to take you and to train your life the way it's spiritually supposed to run so that your life will take on all the beauty and all the wishes that he originally put in your heart. I can tell you, my wife, God showed her little dreams when she was younger that this is how her life's going to end up. Sometimes we just blow that off as nothing. But you'll find out as you've been walking with God, some of those things are coming true. You are God's handmaiden. You are God's special ones. Do you understand? So the good things, the good things keep. Spit out the evil. All right. And finishing. Bless his heart. Okay, look what it says. Come to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. That means I will give you a vacation where you can literally kick back and not worry about anything and just lay out before God. Have you ever done that? I, I do it every day. I lay out before God. What do you do? Lay down? See, there you go with your carnal thinking. I lay out my heart. Lord, lay my heart, let it be open, and scrape out anything that I might have that displeases you. You ask him to do it, and it's not painful. You be stubborn and don't do it, and you're going to have a lot of pain. Because the thing you won't let God cleanse out of your life will be your little tail that will wag your dog. So if you've got something that's not going right in your life and you won't deal with it, it will wag your life. You're supposed to be wagging your tail, not letting their tail wag you. And finishing, go with me to Mark 13, please. This is the story where Jesus is saying, in the end times, you've got to be ready, sober, and watching. Because you don't know what hour the Lord is going to show up. Say amen. amen. So we live for him moment by moment, ready and expecting him to show up. Somebody said, well, you people that preach the rapture. You, uh, you just wait for the Lord. Listen, nobody's going to go in the rapture if they got a beer in their hand and a joint in their hand, and they're disobedient to God. Now, I'm not saying the beer will keep them from heaven, but it's the defiance that will. So let's say God told me, now listen to me carefully, Carrie, I don't want you to drink anymore. Now, I'm not saying that to you. Please don't interpret anything, because there was a day he told me not to. Hello? Because when I was hurt and I was broken, I started drinking again. And, you know, God just took it from me. But he said, son, you've been using this as a crutch instead of leaning on me. So whenever you're upset, you just take a couple of shots and kind of forget about everything. He says, I don't want you to do that because those spirits will open you up to Satan's suggestions. He says, that's why they're called spirits. Do you want to know why alcohol was called spirits? Because the Nephilim, when they fell, taught humanity how to booze and party, how to do witchcraft and mix herbs and spices to pretty yourself up. They taught them against God's wishes so they would corrupt their life. Anyway, we won't go into alcohol. So, I, you know, I used to drink, but not when I was preaching, not when I was a man of God. But when I was away from the Lord, I justified it. Don't let yourself go. You will have such a wonderful time resisting that. And said, instead, just get drunk on God. Yeah. Man, I've been so filled with God, I couldn't walk straight. Yeah. Officer, yeah. officer, yeah. I, I've been to a prayer meeting. <laughs> I, I've been to, really, let me smell your breath. <laughs> Go ahead, put one foot in front of you. I am doing that. You, you understand? Yeah. I went to a tent meeting in Seattle at the 6th Stadium. 
Remember the sick stadium? Huh? On Rainier Avenue? Brother Schambach went and preached a revival, and then the sick stadium got healed, and so they tore it down. But I went to that crusade for a week and a half, every day. I was so filled, I tripped over stent, tent, I had to sit down. People would say, sir, are you lost? To think I'm mentally not there. Why? Because we need to experience God, folks. The old Pentecostals had some things right. They pursued God until they couldn't stand up, operate, until God just took over everything of their life. Now, there's nothing really wrong with that unless you look like a fruitcake. And we don't want you to do that. And finishing. But of the day and the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, even only the Father. Take heed and watch and pray. What would it be doing? What are we do, are you doing? Watching and praying. Watching and praying. Get up in the morning. Ask God to give you his eyes. Be alert. Watch and pray. Okay? Amen. So he said, watch and pray. Why? So you're ready. Okay. It's like a man going to a far country and left his house, the earth, and gave authority to his servants, people, and to each one his work. We have a job to do. And commanded the doorkeeper, the Holy Spirit, to watch. Watch, therefore, you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in evening, midnight, the crowing of the, uh, the rooster, or in the morning. But lest coming, he suddenly find you sleeping. This I say to all, watch. What is the church not doing? I mean, we're talking general. Other than the third world country churches where they're under that extra pressure, the church has been asleep for 20 years. We've been in politics. We've invited gays to be in the pulpit. Yeah. The church has been playing games and been lulled to sleep by the religious author, Satan. Absolutely. Now, let's make a decision right now. Yes. Where are you going to be tomorrow? Are you going to be better off tomorrow than today? Yes. Are you going to make a commitment to, to meet with God? Yes. I'm encouraging you to, I'm not, don't make a commitment to me, and certainly don't make a commitment if you're not going to keep it. And follow through with that, and I guarantee you will not be disappointed. Amen. My wife can tell you, every day we've had 15, 20 answers to prayer. Right in the middle of being attacked and lied about and everything like that, God's just blessing the socks right off of us. So do I put my eyes on what the enemy's doing? Or back on what God is doing. Yeah. All right. Good. Don't be flashy flashed. Don't be tricky tricked. You're not an individual that's not ignorant concerning Satan's devices. No, in all points you seek God so he gives you his wisdom. If you got something out of that this morning, will you give the Lord praise? Yeah. Amen. Now, if you want the out...